Welcome back, podcast world. I'm your host. My friends call me Rasta Jeff, and this is episode 606 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. In this episode, I'm going to do an update on my silver thiosulfate recipe. I'm also going to read a few grow questions, but before we get there, let's do a few shout outs to a few members of the 710 Club. Of course, the 710 Club are the folks who support us on Patreon at the $7.10 a month level or higher. So with no further ado, let's start off with the big Grow From Your Heart podcast. Thank you. Shout out to my friend Blackhawks fan. Let's send a special thank you. Shout out to Justice Smokin'. Let's follow that up with a thank you. Shout out to Alabama man. Let's send a big thank you. Shout out to Matt H and Trium Up. Let's send a special thank you to Levity Love Day. Let's send a big high five and a thank you shout out to a longtime supporter. How about a big shout out to Know Me by My Guacamole? Let's follow that one with a big shout out to Smokey J1360. I want to send a special thank you shout out to Stone Trout Bum. And last, but certainly not least, let's send a big Grow From Your Heart podcast thank you shout out to Caribou Heart Genetics. Big thanks and big shout out to everybody who continues to support the show on Patreon. If you're not already supporting the show and you would like to learn how to do so, all you have to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash grow from your heart. All of the information you need to support the show will be right there on the screen. And of course, I did include a link in the show notes and in the video description to make it nice and easy for all of my friends. All right, big thanks to everybody who supports us on Patreon. I do have a couple of things to talk about before we get to the email portion of the show. The first question I wanted to answer is, why do I post the premiere on YouTube at midnight? That's right. This podcast comes out on mid at midnight on Sunday night into Monday morning or at midnight on Wednesday night into Thursday morning. And there's a good reason for that. Many people have said, hey, I want to hang out and watch the premiere on YouTube, but I can't do it because it is simply too late, which I understand. We have a nice group that hangs out on the Patreon or on the YouTube premiere. Uh, if you're not aware when the video does premiere, there is a chat that goes along with the video. Uh, we hang out, we chat live. Uh, I hang out with the people in the chat. I take some dabs and answer their questions in the chat. It's a nice little crew that hangs out in there. Uh, many people want to hang out, but unfortunately it is just too late for them. Let me explain to you why I post the video at midnight. This podcast started off as a, as an audio only format. There was no video when this podcast first started. I was putting the show up at midnight on Sunday night or into Monday morning so that when people got up for work on Monday, they had something to brighten their day. Many people have to drive to work. They don't feel like driving. Many people have to make some sort of a commute to work. They don't feel like making. A lot of people have to go to a job they don't want to be at. Many people have a job they enjoy, but listening to the Grow From Your Heart podcast on a Monday morning will always make your day better. So my goal was to have the podcast available for everybody Monday morning. If you're on the East Coast getting up real early, it's already there. It came out at midnight. So it's up probably, I guess that's two or three o'clock on the East Coast. If you're getting up for work at four, 4.35 in the morning, the show was there waiting. Also, 12 o'clock gave me the opportunity to make sure that the show posted successfully. Back in the day, there would be some technical issues and I wouldn't get the show posted properly. I'd have to run to my computer, do some adjustments, fix some file names or file numbers or whatever needed to be corrected in uh, the website service. Then that would get the show posted. Now I'm more confident that the show will work at midnight, but I didn't feel like changing the time for a couple of reasons. I am available at midnight. I'm available to be there in the premiere. Uh, I also think that midnight was a fair time to release the show. So I apologize if you're on the East Coast or somewhere else and you can't catch the premiere on YouTube, but that was my intention was to get the show up at midnight so that everybody can watch it the next day. It'll be ready for you no matter what time you get up. I've considered changing the time for the premiere, but it doesn't seem fair to the people who have been joining me since the beginning. And also it doesn't work perfectly for my schedule. I don't know that I can be available before midnight on a Sunday night. I know that Sunday night, at midnight, I'm available. Everybody else is in bed. Everyone else is getting ready for work. I've got the house to myself, some time to hang out. I know that I can get there for those premieres. So I apologize if you're unable to make the premiere at midnight. And that is my reasoning behind doing it at midnight. Also, a lot of people say they missed the live show at midnight. It's not really live. It's pre-recorded. I'm recording. Uh, it's Tuesday afternoon right now when I'm recording. This show will come out uh, Wednesday at midnight, Thursday morning-ish. Uh, a lot of people say they wish they could join the live it is not a live show. It is just a live premiere. The video plays. I'm sitting in front of my computer at home watching on YouTube just like you, but I'm involved in the chat, hopefully just like you. 
that was a really long explanation as to why I post the premieres at midnight, but that is why. There was a reason to it. There was a method to my madness. It started off as an audio show. There was never a video. There was never a premiere. The audio came out at midnight so everybody could listen on their drive to work on Monday. Uh, then it became a video show, and I just never changed the time. That's simply what happened. I like being free at midnight. Uh, I can hang out in the chat. Also, if there's a technical issue, I can repair it at midnight. I've got time to myself. I'm basically alone at midnight most of the time. Everybody else is sleeping. I've got the house to myself. So midnight was perfect for me. I apologize if it doesn't work for you. If that doesn't work for you, maybe you can catch me on my Monday night Instagram live show. Every Monday around 710 Mountain Time, I go on Instagram live and I hang out. I listen to some music. I chat with the entire audience. There are usually about 50 to 75 people that come into my Instagram live video. And if you ask a question on the IG live, I do my best to answer it on the fly. I don't have any notes. I don't have any preparation. I don't have any warning. It is kind of like stump the breeder, stump the grower, or just hang out with the dabber. However you want to do it, I invite you. Monday at 7.10 p.m. Mountain Time. That's Colorado time. I don't know where you are. I don't know your time zone. You're going to have to do some time zone conversions. But Monday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, I am on Instagram. I use Irie underscore genetics as my Instagram name. Follow that account. Watch for me to pop up Mondays around 7.10. All right, I feel like that took a long time to get over that brief note. I've got one more thing I want to talk about before we get into the emails. I got a message from my friend Crazy Hand Grows, and it simply says, I would just love a shout out sometime and maybe a little bit of help to grow my channel. Well, here you go, Crazy Hands. I've got a friend named Crazy Hands Grows who is a great grower. He's a great person. Uh, and I invite you to check out his YouTube channel. It is not as intense and in-depth as my channel. It's a little more lighthearted. It's a little more fun. It's a little laid back. But I do think that my friend Crazy Hands Grows does deserve your subscription. So go check out my buddy Crazy Hands Grows. Crazy Hand Grows on YouTube. Let me make sure it's Crazy Hands or Crazy Hand. It's just Crazy Hand Grows. Go give him a subscribe on YouTube. Let him know Rasta Jeff sent you. Support the community. There's no need to just watch my videos. We can watch everyone's. Go check out Crazy Hand Grows on YouTube. Shout out to my buddy Crazy Hand. All right, where are we going from there? Let's talk about the silver thio sulfate update. In a previous episode, I talked about making our own feminized seed reversal spray. I listened back to it during the premiere and I realized I may have skipped a couple of minor details. Everything I told you will work. You'll be successful with the advice and the plan I gave you. But here are a few more things that may set you up for better success with your silver thiosulfate. Um, get the powdered silver thiosulfate mix. The uh, the sodium nitrate and the uh, thiosulfate. Which ones? Oh, what are they called here? The silver nitrate and the sodium thiosulfate. Get the powdered versions. A couple of people said they found the liquid version on Amazon or somewhere else. Get the powdered version. I don't like the chunks. I don't like the big parts. I like the fine powder. So get those powders. Uh, those powders should be white when you open them up. If they are a dark color, uh, they are starting to degrade. I would not recommend using the darker colored powders. If they've turned dark on you, if they've gotten brown or gray, do not use those. They should be pure white. In my experience, they've always been pure white. I find lower quality, uh, less uh, results when I use darker colored materials. Also, uh, if the water turns dark when you mix the solution, something has gone wrong. You've got some contaminants, some particulates in there. The water should stay clear when you start mixing everything up. It'll go dark when you put the shit in right away because you just added stuff to it. But once it all dissolves, it should be clear. I highly recommend that you use glass containers. Anytime you're pouring the water into anything, doing any mixing, use a glass container. And I said in the episode that I use a butter knife for stirring. The butter knife is metal. Nothing's going to stick to it. I'm not going to add anything. I'm not going to take anything out of my mix. It's non-porous. Uh, it doesn't have other shit on it. So use clean glass containers. Clean them thoroughly. Use clean glass containers and use something metal or sterile for stirring. I use the butter knife simply because I have it. It's sitting around. It's right in the kitchen. I can clean it very well. Nothing sticks to it. It's non-porous. Use glass and metal if possible. Then I highly recommend using distilled water. I don't know if I went over that in the last episode. I highly recommend distilled water. We we're trying to mix up a solution here so we can add certain things to our plants. We don't need other elements, other chemicals, other variables in our mix. We're trying to make silver thiosulfate 
not silver, thiosulfate plus whatever was in the water you started with or whatever was stuck to your previous container. Do everything super clean. All right, so the best way to store your silver thiosulfate, here's something I did not cover. It stores separately, it stores better separately. I said to mix the one powder into 500 mils of water and another powder into 500 milliliters of water. If you're not going to use all of the solution you're making, it is easily stored by not mixing those two together. It will last longer if you don't mix parts A and B. If you have mixed parts A and B, they will still store just fine, but you get a longer shelf life, in my opinion, if you do not mix them. So keep parts A and part B separately, mix them when needed, then dilute and use as needed. If you've already mixed them, that is just fine. That will store just as well, but not for as long, in my opinion. Over time, it will begin to degrade. It won't be as potent. It won't work as well on your plants for reversal. So it stores better uh, non-mixed. Don't mix the two containers together. Or if you can just keep the concentrate stored together, that works well also. Every time you start adding more together, it seems to degrade more quickly. So if you can keep the two jars separate, that's your best bet. You can mix them and have one jar. That's a good bet. Once you've gone to diluting it for spray, that is when you start degrading the product more rapidly. Uh, Store it in a cool, dry, dark place. I put mine in, it's in the glass jars. I put those glass jars in a brown paper bag. I label them so everybody knows what it is, and I stick that in the back of the refrigerator. It's cold, it's dark, it's dry, they're sealed up, nothing's gonna get in there. Make sure nobody drinks your silver thiosulfate solution. If you live with other people, especially children, do everything you need to do to protect your household from contaminating themselves by drinking silver thiosulfate. I don't know what will happen to a person if they drink that. I don't want to find out. Uh, I know that silver is not good for you uh, in large doses. Some people say to use colloidal silver. I'm way off track here. Anyway, make sure you protect yourself and your family so nobody consumes your silver thiosulfate A mix or B mix or the combined solution. Light does degrade the quality of your silver thiosulfate solution. If you've got it diluted, non-diluted, mixed, Uh, However you've got it, keep it dark because the light will cause the product to degrade. It will not be as good of a product. Um, Also, wear gloves and long sleeves when you're spraying this. Also, maybe put down some newspaper underneath the plant when you're going to spray. If you've got a strong, non-diluted mix, sometimes it will turn uh, white walls, will turn a little bit purple. Your skin will get some weird dots on it. You can contaminate things with the silver thiosulfate. So that is my update. I wanted to come in and say... Uh, Dark colored materials are bad. Dark water is bad. Always use glass containers. Always use something non-porous and clean for stirring. Uh, I recommend, highly recommend using distilled water. Store them separately if possible. If you've already mixed it, that's okay. It will still store. The stuff is so cheap that you can just make a bunch more. Don't even worry about it. It's really affordable. Get the products. Use the distilled water. Store it. uh, Non-dilute if you can. If you've already mixed it together, that's fine. Keep it in the fridge. Keep it nice and cool. And always do your best to keep it dark. And most importantly, label the shit out of it. Little kids can't read. So even if you do write silver thiosulfate, don't drink this. The little kids may still get in the fridge one day. They may drink it. Do everything you can to prevent that. That is your responsibility. Be a responsible adult, responsible grower, responsible parent, responsible human being. Let's not damage, injure, make anybody sick while we're attempting to grow good cannabis medicine. All right. That is my update on that part. Now it is time to jump into the email portion of today's episode. The first email on my screen comes from GreenVet88224. Shout out to GreenVet88224. This one came from Patreon. And the question goes just like this. It says, I thought of a question. I've read online that softened water is unhealthy for our plants, cannabis plants included. Yes, that is absolutely true. It says, is this true even when using liquid nutrients? Yes, sir, that is true. It says, I use RO water. I buy the water, but the water at my grow site is softened with a PPM reading of 185. Is the issue that the water is softened with salt? Thanks. I love the podcast from, and they signed it with a real name. I don't know if they want their real name right on the air. You know who you are. Thank you for the great message. And of course, thank you for your service and for the Patreon support. This one goes, and I said service because they call themselves Green Vet 88224. I hope you're a veteran. Either way, you are a ganja veteran or a military veteran. Thank you for that service. Um, They're asking about uh, water softener. A lot of people get water from a well or they've got to use a water softener. It says, I use RO water, but the water at my grow site is softened 
uh, with a PPM of 185. Um, water softeners are, water is softened by, softened, I said that really oddly, but you're getting it. Water is softened by using salts. Uh, they actually use uh, sodium and potassium to soften the water, and at the same time, it removes the calcium and the magnesium. So that is not good for our plants because that sodium is basically like drinking salt water. So it makes our plants think that they are in a drought. They're getting water, but they're not getting hydrated. They keep drinking that water. They're not hydrating themselves. They're saying, hey, I'm thirsty. I should be getting hydrated, but they're just sucking down salt water and getting saltier and saltier. And over time, that will dehydrate and destroy our plants. The sodium will dry out the plants. Um, yeah, it's a lot like being in the ocean and dying of thirst. There's no fresh water there. You've got to clean up that water. All that salt water is not good for you. Your body can't process it. It's not hydrating you in any way. It's just salting you up. So um, yes, uh, the softened water is unhealthy for your plants. Uh, it says that you've got RO water. I would stick with the RO water is what I would do. It's a little bit more challenging. It needs to be buffered. It's harder to keep the pH, but it is not salty as shit and it's not going to kill your plants. So the question is, uh, is this true even when using liquid nutrients? Absolutely, this is true even when using liquid nutrients. Be careful with that softened water because I don't want you to dehydrate your plants, make them all salty. We're trying to grow fine grade cannabis, not salty hemp trees. All right, thank you for the great question. Uh, I'm gonna keep moving forward because I feel like I've got a good flow. This one came from our friend. What's the name they want me to call him? I'm just going to call you Xavier. What's up, bro? Hope you're doing well. The message says, my man, Rasta Jeff, happy new year, bro. Happy new year to you as well. It goes on to say, I hope the start of your year is going excellent. My year has been great. Uh, I'm really excited to move on from 2020 and see what we can do with 2021. We've got a bunch of fresh new starts. And honestly, I am excited about it. All right, it says, unfortunately, I'm starting my new year with sick plants. That's okay. Uh, it says, I'm embarrassed to admit it. Uh, don't ever be embarrassed to admit that you've got sick plants. Things go wrong in nature. Things happen, especially in the garden, especially when you're learning. Uh, admitting it is a huge step. So you've admitted you got a problem. Now we can work on solving it. It says, my once beautiful morning dew plants and seedlings have started showing the ugliest downward clawing, and they are so droopy. So they are downward clawing and they're super droopy. Uh, I can think of a lot of things that will cause that. We will narrow it down. It says even the veins of the leaves look very pronounced and swollen. All right, that's given me a couple more ideas. I feel like I've overwatered. In this case, I'm not sure. I'm going to say you've overwatered. If it is clawing, it's a little bit too watered. If it's droopy and it's been watered, it's probably overwatered. That thick vein you see is a little bit of osmotic pressure possibly. Uh, there's just too much moisture. That leaf is trying to move that water around. It has nowhere to go. It can't let the air. It can't let the water out through the leaf that quickly. Uh, the plants are struggling. It said I feed once a week every Friday. I don't feed as much because it seems like this peat-based soil I use takes forever to dry. Um, well, you just got to adjust to the drying time of that plant. As it, as it gets bigger, your plants are small now. I've seen the pictures. As they get bigger, that dry time will decrease. They'll dry up more quickly because the plants will be eating more. The roots will be larger. There'll be more processing happening in your rhizosphere. Uh, so your watering time will increase. But now I am certain of it that you're overwatering uh, and watering too frequently. You've got to let them dry out a little bit more than what you've been doing before you water the next time. Don't be so eager. Uh, don't think they've got to be thirsty. They got to be hungry because they'll let you know when they're hungry and thirsty, they're letting you know that you've been overwatering them by giving you the claw, the thick vein, and the droopiness. Uh, it says, my plants are all between five and nine inches tall. My two plants are in, uh, two of my plants are in one gallon pots and the others are in six gallon, or six solo cups. So yeah, I'm going to assume that you're overwatering these small plants because they're brand new and you're eager to get nutrients to them. You just want to feed them and get them bigger. I'm going to assume that you're overwatering. It also says, I grow under LED blurple lighting. My last feed was at 600 PPMs. I use advanced nutrients and recharge. That all sounds like it's going to work. My humidity is between 50 and 60%. Uh, that's good for now. It may need to go down soon. It says, my daytime temp is about 78 to 81. That's going to work for you. My nighttime temp is 68 to 73. Uh, that's not too bad as long as you're not getting too much of a swing in your nighttime to daytime temperature. It said, how do I get my plants back to normal. Okay. I looked at some pictures here. There were pictures included in this. The pots you are using are simply too large. You've got small plants. You said that 
Uh, some are in uh, solo cups. The plants that are in the one gallon pots, those should still be in solo cups. Those plants weren't ready to be transplanted. You've got a little tiny root zone and a big container and you're just watering that whole container and that little root zone is saying, that's a lot of water, I didn't need all that. So your first thing is that the pots are too big. The second thing is that they are too wet. When I looked at your photos, I didn't see anything in there for drainage. I don't see enough perlite, I don't see any persolite, uh, but I do see some weird rocks on the top of the plants. I asked about the rocks. Uh, you said you were using those to uh, support the plant. I would get rid of those rocks immediately. I don't know what you're, when you're watering, those rocks have minerals. They're dirty. They got salts on them. You're watering something from those rocks into your plant. That's highly unnecessary. I would pull the rocks out and I would put a stick in there to support that plant that will help you out. Also, I can tell by looking at the pictures and I will include a photo here uh, for the audience that is watching visually. I'll drop in a photo right about now so you guys can see what I'm talking about. But uh, those plants have been overfed. They are too small for the amount of nutrients you're trying to give them. So they need some time to dry and they don't need as much food. I would let them dry, give them more time between feedings, more dry time between feedings. I would reduce the amount of nitrogen and I would definitely remove those rocks from the grow. Those are a few things that should get your plants back on track. And I was fortunate enough to be back in contact with our friend Xavier. He followed our advice and guess what, you guys, his plants look amazing now. He's no longer embarrassed. He's got a healthy crop back on track to get 2021 under control. So thank you for the great message, Xavier. I'm glad I was able to help you out. I hope I'm able to drop that photo here in the video. Uh, you guys comment, let me know what you think of the photo. And if you've got any questions about your grow, please include some photos because that really did help me out. All right, Xavier, I hope we answered your question. I'm excited to see your garden back in track. I'm gonna clear my throat and we're gonna move on to the next message. All right, this next message came from the website. There is a help tab on the website. Simply go to iregenetics.com. You will find the grow help tab. On that tab, I do ask one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I ask you 16 basic questions before you're able to ask the real question. I wanna know what strain you're growing, where you're growing it, what kind of lights you're using, and then I ask a few details of your grow. Then I let you ask me a grow question. <clears throat> Here is the Grow Help tab that came from our friend. Do they want their name used? Yes, this is from Robert. And it says they're growing wedding cake. They're growing it indoors. They're growing under an HPS light. They're in flower. They're in week seven. They're growing in cocoa. The last feed was water, enzymes, and shine. Sounds like a great feed. The pH was 6.0. I would raise that up just a little bit. The PPM or EC was 300. The daytime temp is 76. Nighttime temp is 64. I would uh, warm it up just a little bit. It says nighttime relative humidity is 55. Uh, our daytime relative humidity is 55. Nighttime humidity 55. It says, the problem is my air conditioner took a crap. Uh, that is always a bummer when the air conditioner takes a crap. You got to scramble and get a new one. It says, I cannot get it fixed for a few days due to the holiday and COVID seasons. I understand that completely. It says, my question is, is 75 to 77 degrees daytime temps and 65 degree nighttime temps and humidity uh, and humidity around 55 gonna hurt the grow if those conditions stay for five to seven days, then back to normal, which would be around 73 at night and 65 or 73 during the day and 65 at night with 40% relative humidity. Um, I don't think your plants are going to see any problem with 75 to 77 degrees. I think they're going to enjoy that. <clears throat> I think you could uh, run that temperature all the time and they would be just fine. I like 77 degrees in the grow room. 77 is really nice. The plants are comfortable. I am comfortable. Uh, however, in a commercial environment, I've seen that they get up to about 81 and they seem to perform a little more quickly sometimes. So I don't think you're going to see any problems with the temperature, <clears throat> excuse me for the throat clearing. I do think that maybe your humidity may be a little bit high. So while you are down with your air conditioner and you're getting the higher humidity, maybe consider adding another fan or two, maybe consider watering just a little bit less or less frequently just to keep that uh, humidity down a little bit. If you don't put as much water in the room, that much water cannot get into the air. So that is something I would consider maybe water just a little bit less. But overall, I see zero problems rising from this couple of degrees difference. I actually think that they may benefit from it. Pay attention to them. 
and see if you like this lower temperature compared to your usual higher temperature. This may be something you adjust to and you can save a few bucks or they may like the higher temperature, not the lower temperature. I apologize. That's rarely the case. Um, they may want to be a little bit warmer like you're getting them. So pay attention and see how they react to the higher temps. It'll only be a couple of days, maybe a week or so, but you may notice they grow a little bit more quickly. You get more vigor out of them with that warmer temperature. Although you are fighting that higher humidity, I'm not sure how they're going to do with that, but it won't be too long. You're not going to get bud mold or anything like that, that at that point in flower with that much humidity. Any higher humidity, I would be concerned, but pay attention. Don't let it get too high. All right, I feel like I've answered that question more than thoroughly. Let's send a big thank you shout out to our friend Robert for the great message. If you've got any more questions, I would love to hear from you. All right, let's move into the last message on today's episode. This one actually came from YouTube and it came from our friend Fresh Baked and it says, hey Rasta Jeff, I thought, let's see, I thought age had to do a little bit with pre-flowers. Uh, from my experience, topping early has seemed to make them flower later. Have you seen this as well? I haven't thought about root bound being the trigger and it makes sense. I usually hesitate to up pot from one gallons until I see them. All right. So the question here is about pre-flower. Our friend is saying that they topped their plants and they are wondering if topping the plants will create pre-flower, uh, will cause pre-flower to appear later in the cycle. I've got a good answer for this. The short answer is yes. Topping your plants can encourage your plants to pre-flower a little bit later. And let me explain why. Cannabis plants are apical dominant, meaning they want one top bud. They want one piece to grow up the to the top. That one bud, its goal is to reach up to the top and get pollinated. Usually male plants grow taller than the females. The boys will be up above the girls. The male plant will be just a few inches, maybe a foot higher, depending on your environment and genetics. When pollen starts to fall, it goes down. So that female plant that's right below it, right next to it, that top apical dominant bud is going to get pollinated. So it's got one bud always competing to be up at the top. It wants to make that one big giant, it's a big sex organ. It's looking to get that one big sex organ pollinated. It's like, here I am, coat me in pollen so I can make seeds and I can continue my future. I can continue for more generations. So that plant wants to naturally make an apical dominant top. When you cut out that top, what happens? The hormones that are in that top are no longer there. And the plant goes, hey, I'm not ready for puberty. You just took off my parts that were growing, that were older, that were ready to go into puberty. I'm going to be a little teenager again. And I don't have any of my pre-flower, my maturity, my puberty parts. So you just removed the apical dominant top from that plant. You took out a lot of auxins and cytokinins. The hormones have been moved around in that plant. All of those branches that are down lower that are left, they go, hey, the president is gone. There's a chance for me to be the president now. And they all start trying to work their way up to the top. They want to be the new king. They want to be the new president. They want to be the new leader. They don't know that there are seven, eight other branches, nine other branches trying to get up there to the top to be the leader as well. So they all start taking off. Those new branches don't have the hormones that that old branch had. You cut those, developed those built up hormones right out of the plant. Now the plant thinks it's a youngster again, and it's going, I'm not ready for puberty. It's going to grow a little bit longer until it can move those hormones around. Once the auxins have developed and moved around again, it'll say, oh, now it might be time to start spitting out some pre-flowers. Now is the time to flower. Also, you did mention that being root bound uh, will help with that. Yes, if you don't transplant them soon enough, they will still show their pre-flower. But if you have them in ideal conditions with a big enough pot, they're not getting root bound. You top them, they won't show pre-flower as early because you have removed those hormones from that apical dominant top. And now all your lowers are competing to be the new top and those hormones simply are not there. They are in competition. They're young. They're fucking rampant and they're trying to get up there and be the new Lion King, the new president, the new head of the table, the new top bud. So that is exactly why, in my opinion, from my experience, uh, you don't see pre-flower as early when you top your plants. All right. That was a great question. Thank you for that one. Uh, if you've got any more questions, corrections, comments, or concerns, I'd love to hear from you. My email address is growfromyourheart at hotmail.com. Of course, the best way to get your show, your questions on the show is through Patreon. Check out patreon.com forward slash grow from your heart. Of course, if you've got any, uh, if you want to know anything about Irie Genetics, Rasta Jeff, the Grow From Your Heart podcast, I do recommend you check out iriegenetics.com. All things Rasta Jeff, all things Irie Genetics, all things Grow From Your Heart will be right there at iriegenetics.com. 
Com. All right. I think that is all I've got for you for this episode. I want to thank you guys again for hanging out. Uh, I had a good time on this show. I felt like I had a good flow. Uh, I hope you guys are staying warm. I hope you're staying safe. I'll be back in just a couple of days with fresh new content. I want to give a big shout out to my buddy, Mr. Bagseed. And until next time, take a fat dab and give your mom a hug for me.